Economic Development Commission meeting to order. Recording uh, has started. Yes. Would you say? Oh, recording started. I think I said before you get started. Uh, do we have any changes or agenda uh, changes to the agenda at all today? Not by me. I have none. Jeff, no. Talk to Nisha. No. Okay, great. So no changes to the agenda. Um, due to some some time challenges, we don't have the minutes from the last meeting just yet. We're very sorry. This is not common. Um, I'm 100% sure that those will be up uh, presently in the next day or two. And in the meantime, we will uh, just carry on at knowing that the recording is publicly viewable. Um, it has been shared on social media. It is up on town meeting television. And uh, I feel confident that enough of us were here that we can move into this meeting. Um, item three in our agenda today is public to be heard. If you're a member of the public and you wish to be heard, now is your chance to do so for items not on the agenda. Please raise your hand either in chat uh, by telling us in chat or using the hand raising tool or simply turning on your camera and raising your hand. Yes, Gabrielle Smith, please um, welcome and, and, and go right ahead. I just want to quickly note to everyone who may not realize uh, on the commission and in the public uh, that I am uh, a housing commissioner. I'm on the Essex Housing Commission. I'm not here in that formal capacity, but we do try to sometimes come into other meetings and um, hear what other commissions are doing. So that is uh, just want to make sure you all were aware of my role. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gabrielle, for your constant dedication to community and for being on the Housing Commission. And for being here today. If there are any other members of the public that would like to be heard for items not on the agenda, now is the time. Going once, going twice. The dog is trying to get in on this, but I'm going to say no to him. Great. Okay, moving on to item four. Uh, cannabis discussion. Um, I have uh, the Economic Development Commission via myself, Annie Cooper, has invited Mariah Sanderson, uh, the coalition director for the Burlington Partnership for Healthy Prevention Works Vermont, to present some information that is not commonly presented at an Economic Development Commission meeting. The reason that um, I feel strongly that this is a good idea is not simply about cannabis and about the health of our community in that regard, but about a bigger picture vision that I believe in for economic development, for the Economic Development Commission, which is that business, residents, community, all, all are important at, at, at this meeting and, and how all of that affects each other, I believe belongs here. Um, at our at our table for discussion. So uh, that being said, I uh, welcome and invite Mariah Flynn Sanderson, village resident, um, to uh, share with us uh, some information. Mariah, will you do me a favor? Will you do a better job than I have in introducing yourself because I'm stumbling a little bit? Sure, I'm happy to. Thanks. And am Thanks. I going to be able to uh, share the presentation, or will someone else do that? It's a great question, Darren. Um, I forgot to ask you that earlier. Mariah, I can promote you to a presenter so that you can share your screen. Wonderful. Great. OK, let me just do that real quick then. I am not as familiar with. Um, with using Teams, I usually use Zoom, so give me a second while I figure out how to do that. <laughs> yeah, if you're on the app, there's a um, little box with an arrow pointing up. There you go. There you go. You can see it? We can see it, yes. Okay, great. Um, and I don't know if there's a the only worry is that now I can't see any of you. Okay. Uh, I believe that in the bottom. Of this screen, you might be able to see me and you, but if you can't, that's also fine because most people have their cameras off anyway. Okay, great. Well, I can see you all, but if so, maybe just 
talk and tell me if you have a question or want me to stop about something. <laughs> sure. Because it is, I, I understand it's very awkward to uh, suddenly be alone in a room talking to yourself about material that you're trying to share to others. So I, I get that and we will, um, we will let you know as you go if we want to ask a question. Sounds great. And let me let, sorry, I'm ready to interrupt you. Anyone in, um, on the commission, I see Brian is here. Now, if we, uh, Brian, Jeff, um, or Tatanisha, uh, and myself, well, raise a hand if you uh, want to comment. Do, actually, just be, if you're on the commission, just speak up during the presentation if you want to ask Mariah something. Um, and I, I extend the same, the same privilege to um, all of staff and Sam. Um, and anyone that normally sits at our table, if you have a comment or a question during the presentation, feel free to politely uh, insert your your comment, remark, or question. All right, thanks, Mariah, sorry. Sure. Um, so uh, as Annie said, my name is Mariah Flynn Sanderson, um, and I uh, am the Coalition Director for the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community. So I work on public health and substance misuse prevention in Burlington, um, but this is the community that I live in. So um, I have a vested interest in this community, which is why Annie um, invited me to come speak here today. Um, and I, you know, I come from the world of public health, so that'll be what I talk about, and you can think about how that's relevant to the work that you're doing in this commission. Um, and I'm sorry, I was typing this up re and realized I just kind of naturally write Essex Junction a lot, because that's where I live, but I meant, I meant to say Essex here. Um, and I use uh, she, her pronouns, just if that's helpful for anyone. Um, so now I just have to figure out how to switch to the next slide. So I always start with a couple of disclosures when I do a presentation, just so you know. So as I said, I'm the Coalition Director for Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community. I'm also on a couple of statewide and regional um, groups working on substance misuse prevention. So there's one at the county level called the Chittenden Prevention Network and one at the state level called Prevention Works Vermont. I'm part of both of those. And then I live here um, in the village and I have two teenagers that are at ADL and EHS. Um, and I'm also in my uh, personal life part, a steering committee member of a grassroots organization called Smart Approaches to Marijuana Vermont. Um, so I'm just I'm going to try to go quickly because I know we don't you don't have a ton of time. I could talk about this kind of issue around um, promotion of legal substances and how it impacts the community and public health probably for a couple of hours. Um, so there's way more to say than I've said I'll say here today. And, um, you know, if there's ever any more information. I'm happy to um, answer questions or come back again or whatever else is useful. But I'll just quickly kind of note a few things about Act 64, which is the uh, law that passed this year to legalize commercial sales of cannabis and how that impacts the conversation today and then share a few data points, very few, um, and talk about risk and protective factors for substance use at a community level and then like at a municipal level what we can do to reduce substance use, misuse. Um, so I always think it's helpful to make sure that everybody's on the same page when we're using language about what we're, we mean. So um, I get um, in my field, the words cannabis and marijuana are often used interchangeably to mean the same thing, and in some ways they do, but um, uh, they are, it is, the definition is slightly different. So cannabis is the plant, right, all the products that are derived from the cannabis plant, and there's a lot of different things that come from that. And then marijuana refers to the parts or uh, the products or the plant um, that's usually the leaves and the flowers that contain the THC, the part that is the psychoactive component that gets people high. Um, and um, in our state and just in general, people are more, um, are you replacing marijuana with cannabis with THC or some other way to delineate um, the psychoactive components of cannabis just because there's a, um, some racial history connected to use of the word marijuana. But you'll see it interused interchangeably a lot. Um, and it's important to note that in Act 164, that law I mentioned, um, the legislature mandated that marijuana be changed to cannabis in all the laws. So in that, for the purpose of that, um, they're referring to anything that contains more than 0.0% THC. Just an FYI, Maria, this is yeah. really helpful and beneficial and we're all listening. Uh, thank you so much. Keep going. Sure. And I tend to, just to FYI, I tend to... Um, 
make my slides a little text heavy. So I'm going to gloss over a few things just in the interest of time, but you have the slides and the purpose of making them text heavy is so that you can refer back to them later too. So um, so I might scoot over stuff that and you're like, oh, there's more on there, but um, it's just so you can have it for later. Great. So Thanks, CPD, Jamal. which you might have seen kind of popping up in stores across Vermont, is uh, stands for cannabidiol. Um, it's one of the components in cannabis. Um, it's usually derived from the hemp plant and um, it by itself, it does not usually cause a high like THC. Um, so CBD uh, is allowed to be sold in stores in Vermont if it contains less than 0.03% of the THC like I mentioned. And the thing I always, um, I think there's a lot of confusion around this product. I don't want to get into that today, but um, but I do want to kind of note here that CBD is not currently regulated for safety and purity by the Food and Drug Administration. So there's no necessarily, you don't know that there's 0.3% or less of active THC in it. Um, and when they've done some tests around that, they found that, um, that oftentimes there are things in there that are not on the label. So it's just to note. Um, so I'm not going to go over the Act 164 basics, but I put it in here so you'd have it. It just kind of notes um, what passed for the law, what communities are being asked to look at. And one of the things I wanted to kind of just key to is that that um, that top one, which is what I think the reason for this discussion today is that retail sales of cannabis will be allowed in communities in Vermont that vote to opt into that. Um, so communities have to have a vote um, and that um, retail sales at this point, unless things change, there is a proposed bill to change some of the pieces of that at this point will um, be uh, able to start in March of 2022 for some licenses and in October of 2022 for all licenses. Um, and then there's the timeline here for kind of what's happening in Vermont right now around um, at the state level around um, around getting things ready for retail sales. Um, and kind of the thing to note about that is that there's a cannabis control board that's been um, put in place that is working on uh, additional rules and regulations that will happen for cannabis. So there's a lot that's still unknown, and I think that's important for communities to know especially if you're thinking about whether or not to have a vote on this in the community. Uh, you, one of the things I recommend is waiting until we actually know what the rules are going to say, what the regulations are going to be so that you know what you're voting on. Um, and so why I care, why I think um, communities should care about access to cannabis at a our, our level and how we think about the policy for that is that um, we we already have a cannabis use rate, uh, um, cannabis use problem among our youth in our state. So um, substance use rates for Vermont high school teens have been dropping over the last decade, um, except for marijuana or cannabis. And in here, I'm using the word marijuana and cannabis interchangeably. Yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I, I apologize. Um, okay. Anyone that has their microphone on, uh, please turn it off. I can see that Irene Renner's microphone on is on. I can see. Uh, oh, thank you. That's great. Mariah, I'm so sorry that I then made noise to interrupt you. <laughs> no, no worries. Happy enter anytime. Oh, there Thanks. go the top. Sorry. Um, so, uh, so here I'm using the word marijuana because that is what uh, the, the survey where the state collected this information, that's the language they use. So, um, so in Vermont, our marijuana use rates increased the last time youth were surveyed about it um, from two percent uh, from I'm sorry, 24 percent in 2017 to 27 percent in 2019 and I actually pulled out the data for Essex High School, too. So we'll take a look at that in a little bit. Um, but this is something to be thinking about. Our, our cannabis use rates, are, our marijuana use rates are already increasing. So how are we as a community going to address that and think about that to support our kids in Essex? Um, and I should note that even though uh, substance use rates in Vermont and other areas around tobacco use and, um, and alcohol use have been dropping, Vermont has historically for quite a long time had the highest uh, substance use rates for youth in the nation for the for alcohol, tobacco and cannabis. 
Um, so even though our rates are dropping, we're still much higher than a lot of other states, and it's something to be paying attention to. Um, so this is just to just quick visual to show you that this is just Chittenden County data. I didn't have time to pull out Essex, but um, our uh, rates of kids in high school who binge drink in the past 30 days, who said they binge drink in the past 30 days, which is to have uh, either four or five um, drinks within a, a one uh, block of time um, have been dropping, which is great. Um, and then this is our uh, Essex High School YRBS data I just pulled out from uh, the data that's online. You can just see the blue line is alcohol, so it shows that um, in Essex actually alcohol use went down was going down and then did a little uptick just recently um, and cannabis <coughs> which is the green line has been our marijuana use has been um, uh, we were already at a slightly higher rate so we're now kind of matching the state rate um, and you can see one of the other things to be thinking about as a community is that vaping has become a real challenge for Vermont youth. Um, so the first time we started asking questions on this survey in the state about electronic tobacco use or vaping um, was in 2015. So we only have data starting there, but it um, set like drastic increase very fast. Normally these uh, rates of use change at a very slow increments and um, Vaping is one of those things that did not follow that same trajectory. Um, so the big thing to know kind of in terms of thinking about substance misuse prevention or how to help uh, kids make healthy choices is that delaying the age of first use is really important or delaying uh, kids using while their brains are still developing is the way I think about it. So um, a lot of people talk about um, addiction or substance use disorder is really an adolescent disease. Nine, um, ninety percent of the people who who develop a substance use disorder started using before they were eighteen. So if you can just get kids to wait until those brains are fully developed, it's likely that they'll never develop a problem. So that's something to be thinking about when you think about policy at a local level um, and how we support kids. Is what can we do to help encourage them to delay use for as long as possible? And the way we talk about that in in Burlington, where I do work, is to say make the healthy choice the easy choice, and and that's for everyone, not just for kids. Mariah, excuse yeah. me. Um, this is Raj, um, one of the trustees. I, can you just talk a little bit about, or I don't know if we have time, but. Um, how this relates to other issues youth might be experiencing. Um, you know, my understanding from the YRBS data and from other research is that, you know, students that are participating in these behaviors are also um, more likely to experience depression and other risky sexual behaviors. Um, they're more often, uh, these impacts are disproportionate on um, minorities and, and students who are LGBTQ, um, so it, 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 I think it extends a little bit beyond, or I'd like to hear if you think it extends a little bit beyond um, simply the idea that they're using um, a substance and, and usually as a, either a, a sign of other risky behavior or, um, and it's often hard to, to figure out, I think, what, what came first, you know, what the cause and effect are, but um, I think that's an important um, piece of information to keep in mind that, and I don't know if that's what you're finding, but that's, yeah. that was my understanding as well. Absolutely. That's a really important point. Um, that, that, that substance use is usually mixed up with a whole bunch of other risky behaviors for kids. And, you know, and, and I'm talking about this in terms of developing a substance use disorder, but you can also think about it in terms of if you want to create healthy kids who thrive in their future and have future success, um, you know, supporting them along a variety of different um, ways. Sub preventing substance use is kind of one piece of that puzzle. It's not at all the pieces, um, but it is connected to things like um, risk for depression and other uh, uh, mental health issues. Um, and you're right um, that there's um, are, so again, I, I work with the Burlington data all the time, and I've only just recently started looking at our Essex data. But um, so I'll talk about the state and, and maybe folks can delve into the Essex data, but um, at the in Vermont and in most communities, our students who are identifying as LGBT, um, which is the way that um, the questions are asked on the survey, uh, uh, have higher um, rates of kind of 
risky behaviors, particularly substance use, than students who are not identifying as LGBT. Um, and and that the ver that varies a little bit for um, student for BIPOC students. So um, oftentimes the BIPOC students are um, are reporting um, higher rates of struggling with mental health issues and um, lower kind of assets in the community. So lower rates of feeling like they matter to adults in the community, but um, that doesn't always correlate to substance use. Sometimes we see that happen in other things. Um, so it's a little it's a little bit different there, but um, but yes, this does impact our um, some of our more vulnerable populations more. So it's something to be thinking about if you're thinking about trying to create a community where everyone thrives. Um, you know, looking at how you promote substances really impacts that. Or how? So yeah. So if you if you have a population that may be already at risk or struggling, um, access is an important um, issue, basically. Yes, and we can talk more about this, but you know, historically too. Um, and I don't know how this will play out in Essex, but in Burlington, one of the things we look at is um, our lower income neighborhoods end up bearing the brunt, brunt of retail because they end up having more retailers in the lower income neighborhoods. So kids who live in those neighborhoods see more advertisements, see more um, promotion of substance use than kids who, who don't. And so um, that's something to be thinking about. How are we creating a community that doesn't inadvertently or advertently target uh, vulnerable youth as well. I see Oiso's hand up. Just dive dive in there, Oiso. Excuse me, Mariah. Go ahead. Hi. Hi, Mariah. This is Oiso Makuku. I'm the um, interim community development director for the town. Hi. Oops. And I had a question because I was just listening to the NPR piece on the Sacklers yesterday, and I wondered what um what role opiates. I mean, you didn't give any data on on pills and opiates or anything in the community, and I wonder under what category those may have fallen in your um, in your graph? Yeah, so there's a reason I left those out and um, it's not because opiate use isn't a problem and it isn't something to be looking at. It's because for, you know, I focus this presentation on youth and for youth, the place where they usually start substance use is not with opiates. So it's with um, cannabis, tobacco and alcohol. That's usually the first use for um, or for most people. Um, so when you think about opiate use, it's really um, uh, kind of the second tier. Uh, students who are already using or already struggling with problems with these substances then often graduate to. So uh, I like to think about, I think people talk about what's the gateway drug? What's the drug that like leads to all of their substance use? And there is no one gateway drug, but these three kind of are the gateway drug. These three are the the ones that lead to other future problems for youth. So it's kind of that same reason. Um, so I didn't focus on opiates and <coughs> we could look at it, but the rates of opiate use are much smaller than. Um, oh no, and I didn't want, I we didn't need to focus on it. I just wondered um, yeah. because it has been so much in the media over the past few years and of it's course. It's a really important point uh, that you bring up is that it is the one that gets talked about the most because sometimes the, you know, for folks who, um, who develop a substance use problem with opiates, it ends up being devastating, right? And so, and there's so many consequences for the individuals and the families and the community. Um, so we talk about it a lot, but in terms of the larger impact, these three actually have much more financial impact on communities or on our state. We end up putting a lot of resources um, to deal with the consequences of this use more than the other. Um, I'm going to move on just in the interest of time, but but it is an important point to think about. We often put a, there's a lot and a lot of attention on opiates, but um, but um, it's good to think about all of the substances in our community and how they're impacting health. Um, so uh, so investing in prevention, and again, this you can think about how this re is relevant for your commission, but um, saves money, which is usually common sense for most people, but um, this is some data from the health department saying that every dollar we invest in prevention saves 10 to $18 that we might end up later having to spend on things like health care, criminal justice, um, or lost productivity at work. Um, and if you think about, um, uh, some people talk about this in terms of uh, alcohol and tobacco and marijuana, and opioids and the other drugs in the community kind of turn up the heat for kids and prevention strategies, things that you do at a community level 
can turn down that temperature and keep things from boiling over for kids. That's just a way to kind of think about it. Um, Vermont uses the, this is the Vermont prevention model also taken from the Vermont Department of Health. Um, so if you want to think about uh, reducing youth use or preventing problem use within a community, the best way to do that is to think about hitting strategies at every one of these levels. Um, and today I'm just going to focus on that community level. What's the physical environment look like? What's the social norms in the community? What's the cultural environment? Um, but but true prevention or true public health models, this is really a public health model, um, don't aren't um, are only effective if you're really supporting people at all of these levels. And you can have the most impact at that policy and systems level. So the um, we tend oftentimes folks tend to um, it's hard to think about beyond the individual strategies like how do you um, we you know think about mentor programs or things like that that support an individual person. But if we really want to create change or we really want to create a supportive community, we 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 also work higher up to at policies and systems. So there are things like risk factors within a community um, and there are protective factors. Risk factors kind of um, can uh, lead to um, increased use or problem use and then protective factors help keep that um, to help keep make it easier for people to make healthy choices. So uh, these are just a couple of pictures. They're actually a little bit old. I did a community presentation a couple years ago where uh, community members went out and took pictures of their community. And so I just pulled a couple of the ones from Essex to use for this slide. Um, and I'm trying not to like call out any one place, but you might recognize some of these um, from our community. Um, so this is just one of the risk factors for underage use within a community is if the community norms are either unclear about substance use or they um, encourage use or promote use. Um, and one of the protective factors, one of the things that makes it easier for people to make healthy choices is if the policies and the social norms within the community encourage non-use or um, responsible use or however we want to think about that. Um, so I just put a little picture here of Maple Street Park where they have a nice sign that, that prohibits alcohol and smoking. So in a public place, um, uh, people are encouraged not to use and not use in front of kids. Oh, there's the arrows. I was wondering where those went. Um, and so uh, so I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what when you're thinking about the new law. Um, one of the things I would encourage our community to do is be proactive, regardless of what the community decides, whether to have retail cannabis in um, in Essex or not. Um, there's a lot that we actually should be looking at already in terms of how our community is designed around alcohol and tobacco. And um, there's a lot that we can do uh, prior to even allowing any more retailers in the community to help support people. And so this is just a little data around the impact of cannabis advertising. And there's more and more kind of information being collected about that now that there are legal sales in other states. Um, but just shows that exposure to can marijuana or cannabis advertising is associated with higher rates of use among adolescents. Um, and this lovely picture is a young lady who works with us in Burlington. Um, so when thinking about community level prevention, there are some root causes of substance misuse at the community level. Um, normalization of use, um, access and availability, um, for use, um, substances availability in the community, low perception of harm. If, if people don't think that the substance is harmful, then they're more likely to use, um, which is a, definitely a challenge that we have with cannabis. There's a lot of misperceptions there around harm. Um, and then, like I said, early onset of use substance misuse, so people using early. And some of the things that you can do to prevent youth initiation in use is create um, buffers for adult only product sales near places like schools and other places kids gather. So if you think about a lot of these strategies are really just about um, not having kids constantly bombarded with advertising and messaging that promotes use um, or uh, you know, being in constantly being in situations where adults are using or using excessively. So thinking about our 
our community events, how often do they promote alcohol um, or uh, are they or are they smoke free? Um, so pro prohibiting use in public and a family friendly events um, and then requiring clear warnings on labels at stores and maybe information about health risks, ban banning smoking and vaping in public areas um, and looking at uh, establishing density max maximums. So that means like in communities where um, there are uh, a density of retailers, so a lot of retailers within a small area, um, people use at higher rates. Um, and I don't know that we have too much of an issue with that in Essex yet, but, um, but it's always good to be uh, proactive, like I said, because it's very hard once you've already, as folks have probably realized over the years, once you've already approved a license to then realize, oh no, we have too many here. Um, so it's better to create zoning or um, or ordinances that allow us to already um, keep that from happening, keep uh, from becoming what's called like a tobacco or a, re or a cannabis or an alcohol swamp where you have too many in one area and it ends up causing problem use. Can I ask you a quick question? It's Raj. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Um, sure. Do you have anything uh, at your fingertips for what CDC and others recommend for minimum distances for some of this stuff you know i think i think there are some suggestions i just can't recall there are and people do it differently to based on the um on the community and the design of the community <laughs> so um and actually i've just been starting to look at are there recommendations for density which i haven't found yet but there are recommendations for like how far away or um those buffer zones i was talking about so most a um, lot of the places I've seen communities have created a thousand foot buffer, so not within a thousand feet of a school or a community center or, you know, in in our area it might be Essex chips where kids gather. Um, but some places do it um, even farther away. So there's definitely others where it's like a half mile radius. Um, so you'd have to think about what what fits and works for this community. Yeah, I imagine um, thinking about the village downtown and how it it's sort of the hangout uh, hub for students coming, you know, the, the basically most students going to school, if they're walking, travel through that area and congregate after school, um, especially <clears throat> especially the the fourth to twelfth graders, for instance. Um, they're the ones that that you're more likely to see, especially uh, in warm weather as we make more areas for that possible in, in the village center. So I'm be curious how we do that and if Brownell is you know, as a, a <clears throat> as a youth center, um, almost a community center, how that how that fits into where we where we able to site some of these thoughtfully. Yeah, that's a really important point. I think you're right. It's the what it's the place that I think about a lot when I think about what could Essex do is that area because you're right, kids are constantly walking through there and um, and I. Um, you know, a few years ago when we started to have vape shops pop up, pop up again or pop up all over the place in our community, I thought, gosh, we didn't plan for this very well. Right. So yeah. um, because they all they, for a little while, there was a whole bunch right in the area. Kids are walking around. So um, there's a couple different ways to think about that, whether it's in terms of density or or whether it's one other thing you can do is eliminate um, window or sidewalk or street view advertising. So if there are places where kids are unlikely to go inside, um, it, it could just be about, you know, eliminating the advertising on the outside. Um, but if it's things like, um, you know, corner stores where um, where kids are going to be going in for a snack after school or whatever, then you might want to think about it differently. But um, there's a lot of things. So I think there's no one answer. There's no one like uh, this is, you know, the right fit because you do have to look at your own community and what's going to be what makes sense here. Um, but uh, I think the kind of key recommendation I would say is, you know, just in general, I showed you cannabis advertising information, but in general, youth are more impacted by advertising than adults are. Um, and there and research shows for uh, lots of research over long periods of times that advertising of alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, it doesn't really matter the substance. Kids are more impacted by that, and the more they see of it, the more likely they are to have favorable attitudes about using, and the, and then eventually that leads to kind of uh, more likely to use substances. So the more we can just create a community that supports healthy choices, that doesn't promote substance use, um, 
or misuse, um, the better kids thrive. Um, and there's lots of other ways to, you know, it's not just about advertising. And California has done a lot of work around this, around this topic. Yeah. And so, um, and so I think they'll be a good resource. Um, also, um, the colorful advertising and making it look like it's candy and, um, and tasty are, um, are aspects of the, um, of advertising to children that has been absolutely banned in California. But we have some good precedents. I guess that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, I think that's great. There's, I think that's an, also an important point is that we're not the first to be looking at this. There's so much great information out there about what other communities are doing, what's been successful. So like I said, I only pulled out a tiny bit of things, but there's um, there's a lot out there for us to learn from. And and I don't want, you know, I'm like I said, I'm I'm sharing this with the thought about the community at large, not necessarily related to Act 164. So um, I have my own opinions about whether or not uh, we should even allow a vote in Essex. But one of the things that um, on whether or not to have cannabis retail here, um, I do think we should be really thoughtful about our own community and what that might look like in this community. I think Essex um, is a very um, you know, is a large school district. There's a lot of youth and families here. So you have to think about it differently than another area, which is maybe more rural um, or has less families and kids. Um, it may not, it might not be a good fit for this community just because of the design or the population here. So you ha we have to be really thoughtful. It's not, I wouldn't, you know, I, I would want us to think about what, what makes the most sense here. Uh, Mariah, I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt for a second because I see Brian's hand up, but I want to interject just for a moment for the for the community at large in that I um I believe uh, cannabis has space in our community for sales, and I did. I just want to make sure that nobody thinks that I invited Mariah here to to you know take some kind of political stance against sale of cannabis. So I believe confidently that uh, cannabis sales does have a a home in our community if the committee that is formed um that's getting formed now also agrees with that and so i just want to make sure that no one thinks i'm out here playing some kind of uh politics with this brian can you please go ahead and wait well wait. Hold, hang on hang on annie i i, I just want to i i hope we don't predetermine the outcome i mean it sounds like what you're saying is the economic development commission nope. is i mean nope. you know these are important nope. things to consider and i i Raj, you know, I'm only I, saying that as a person, I did not personally invite Mariah here to set some kind of political stage. I am not speaking for the Economic Development Commission at all. But I do believe that this conversation, just look at you and me talking about it right now. This conversation belongs at a business table. It belongs at a, like, absolutely this, this kind of conversation must take place for our community to decide and choose what to do next which is why the committee is being formed, which is where this conversation goes next away from the EDC. I guess I guess my only point to that, and I appreciate that as always, Annie, I do, um, is that I, I don't want that view necessarily to be labeled a political view. Oh, fair. Uh, it's science, it's public health, it's the things we need to be considering first and foremost before we do any business. And so sure. I'm sensitive to the, to the idea that that would be misconstrued as a political opinion when really we're talking about science. Okay, so, I, agree, I agree with you and my apologies because now I better understand our conversation from last night and I agree with you at 100%. And, and I'm, um, I'm not saying that I'm against it. I just want to make sure that it's well thought out. I think like everyone else. So right. that's yeah. all I'm saying. And Thanks. I see that people are wanting to make sure that we have someone other than Mariah speaking. And I agree, which is where that happens next at the committee table. So for us, it is not common at the Economic Development Commission to have a public health speaker. And the reason I thought that that was a novel idea is that uh, without this look, I don't know that the I think the committee needs to have this in mind as they move forward. And I think that from a business standpoint, we don't frequently invite public health to a conversation, and we should. Can I point out? Agreed. This is Sam. Can yeah. I just point out, as you're discussing, uh, does it fit or not fit, that currently there's legislation in front, uh, a bill in front of our state legislature 
that would say if a community does not vote for or against uh, retail cannabis sales, um, it's assumed then that the community uh, will uh, not it's the community will then be assumed a yes vote and cannabis can be sold in that community. Right. So unless you have a, a vote um, before the set date in the bill, they're going to make, the bill would make the decision for you. Sure. Right. The goal of the, the cannabis study committee that we're putting together um, internally from of the different boards and committees and relevant departments like police um, is to gather information to present to the public before a vote is held in November, I believe. Right. Right. Great. That's the goal. Right. Um, Great. Yes. And and to that vein, for one second, I, what I want to do right now is we never got to Brian. And then, uh, Mariah, I'm not sure how much is left of your presentation, but I, I feel a lot of hunger for conversation that I want to open the floor to. Um, Brian, can you share your thoughts now? And then I will... Uh, go back to Mariah to to somehow either maybe pull her presentation down so we can have conversation and then put it back up or finalize or something. Let, let's go to Brian. I just had a quick question. I'm uh, sensitive to Mariah's uh, uh, the, the line item in, on the previous slide about uh, density. Um, however, it was my impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, that Act 164 only allowed one one retailer per town. Um, so maybe that's not an issue, but maybe I'm wrong. So I didn't know if you knew Mariah. Uh, that is uh, incorrect. Okay. <laughs> so there's, I think what you might be thinking about is that, like, like I said, there's retailers that will be allowed in March of 2022, and then all retailers allowed in October of 2022. Um, and in March, it's just a few, um, uh, uh, a few that qualify for that, so that might be where that's coming in. Like there, there won't be as many then. Uh -huh. yeah, but, right. but I think the so this is actually one of my last slides. There's just one yeah. that's just resources. Because Mariah, what I want to do next is that if there's any strong feelings about our conversation, they, those strong feelings need to come at me because I invited you here, and I want to make sure that you don't end up in a conversation that's not anything that has to do with you. All you have done is come here and present information at my invitation. So well, please. Rep. I mean, please, I'm happy to answer questions and I don't mind strong conversation. Okay. I'm happy with that. I'm totally fine. Okay. And like I said, I'm I'm addressing this from a public health perspective. Okay. So you all have to think about that from a lot sure. of other perspectives, right? That's so um, so from a public health perspective, there's considerations to think about. From a prevention perspective, there's considerations to think about. And then um, in the interest of time, Maria, in the interest of time, what I'd like to do, and I'm sorry for being so bold. I know I sound a little rude. What I'd like to do is have you finish that up and then I, and then we'll pull the presentation slide down and then I will bring the meeting back to me and I will control hands raised and conversation directed to me. Sure. And we'll and have you answer questions as they get asked of you. Good? Absolutely. Thank you. So, I mean, the only thing I want to say is make sure that public health is part of the conversation or you can end up with unintended consequences for some of yeah. these policy decisions if you don't have people at the table who, who can kind of guide some of that. Um, and then the other is there's so many great resources to help in, make informed conversations and informed thought about this. And I just put a few of them here, but there's a lot more just like toolkits for communities. Um, a lot of the like this Vermont League of Cities and Towns to, did a really comprehensive overview of what exactly we can do in Vermont. Um, so there's lots out there to help with this conversation. Great. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is thank you because your uh, willingness to come even when you asked me why. So just for the public knowledge, you even said to me, do I belong at this meeting with this presentation? I said yes. And if nothing else happens this morning, but that people get into strong conversation, that is exactly what civic engagement is. And we, you and I have done a great job of um, uh, creating that, uh, that conversation right here today. So what I'd like to do now, thank you for pulling that presentation down, is thank you so much, Mariah, for your time, your energy, and your patience. Um, anyone that has questions for Mariah or for anyone else, I'd like them to go through me. And I also wanna make sure that I invite um, 
I don't know if, uh, what I want to do before I move to hands is ask Lori Houghton, uh, our, our rep, sorry, Lori, <laughs> I see I surprised you. Ask you, Lori, if you have anything to say right now before I move on to other questions. No, the only thing I would say is the reference to the March 22nd and the reference um, to the vote that Senate that bill came out of Senate. It did pass out of Senate. It um, is not currently being addressed in the in the House, so I don't know what the chances are of it passing out this year, just to give everyone an update on that. And then just in general, I'm here, you know, um, to help answer questions as whatever committees are formed or whatever direction you take. Please use me as a resource. Great. Thank you so much, Lori. So to be clear to everyone, the committee that's being formed is being formed by our community development team of town and village of Robin, uh, 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 Mc, Mc, sorry, Oiso, I panicked and said your name incorrectly, of Oiso and Robin. And um, the, the committee uh, sits in their hands with their decision making and the committee goes there to to have this discussion at a larger level. In the meantime, I'm really excited about the tension in the room because that is exactly what civic engagement is. Brian Sheldon, I would like to go uh, to Brian Armstrong unless you guys- Just a quick member. correction. Yes. It originates from the from the manager's office. Thank you, Oiso, for that clarification. Yeah. I was trying to put it towards where it went and I didn't state that yeah. clearly. So to, that's restate, fine. to restate whether Oiso's correct correction, it originates with our manager's office, our unified manager's office. Uh, Brian Shelton, may I go to Brian Armstrong first, or would you like to speak first? No, I, uh, my hand is up from previously. Please move oh, on. Oh, great. Brian Armstrong, I believe you're the next hand up. Good morning, and thank you everyone for the time today, as well as the uh, fierce conversation. I'm a born and raised Essex Junction uh, former resident. I now live in South Burlington. You know, so I am very aware of definitely the challenges. I've got uh, three stepchildren that I've raised. And I think a couple of things that we may get lost. The availability of marijuana, for better or for worse, is actually, you know, already exists at a high level. With the legalization allow people to grow, I think there's also a natural chance that you're going to see not legal product, but homegrown products start to increase. You know, for the record, as many of you may know, I also uh, shareholder in Magic Man, which is a CBD company at the Essex Experience. And I just want to state that our hope and our intent is that Essex will move forward to this, but we want to contribute in a positive, responsible way. I'd be very open to have either excise tax towards substance control. My concern is that if the town doesn't opt in, we're going to live in the same cloud of the myth, you know, that just because it's illegal means the access is going to stay out. I'd rather see a town that I've been born and raised in and that I love get to the point where they have more proactive controls for community members and help any movements forward fund the actual substance control. In researching this morning, there's actually actually some indications from, I think it was the Newport Academy that indicated that oddly enough, legalization uh, had a saw a decrease in some use of youth in California and Washington. Now, for the record, I've seen conflicting statements to that from the NIH. So my hope is that we'll be able to move forward in a way that recognize what's currently happening in our community and better fund substance control, not through the foolishness of banning it, that it's not going to happen in the community. Uh, uh, before I call on someone else, I would like to say that honestly, literally, this is what civic engagement is. Literally, this is what we're supposed to be doing here. Yes, please, Lori Houghton. Hi, thanks. I, I actually do have to go. Um, so first, I want to say thank you for this important conversation. But I also want to say that in the bill that in the in the act, so in I think I think it's more Ryan knows better than I. Um, I remember it as S52, but whatever the act is, um, it does have a substantial part of the retail going to a substance prevention fund. That was actually one of the reasons why the bill was delayed in passage, because there were many, many of us that pushed to ensure that some of the revenues, um, I forget the exact amount, are going. And, and quite frankly, it's not enough. It won't be enough if this, um, you know, if more retail shops open, but it is a start. So, but thank you for this conversation. I apologize, I do have to go. Thank you for being here and thank you for being present to it. And we really appreciate you. Uh, Brian, is your hand up? Uh, and you're welcome to want to speak again, uh, or is it still up from before? It actually took it down, but I will add as well, one of the reasons why I've, and I own several businesses or part owners of several businesses, one of the reasons why I'm passionate about this 
is I believe through small businesses, we can provide more economic opportunity to all classes of the community and create a more vibrant community through better sustained, you know, economic opportunities. And my, you know, we've already in our short time, and this is CBD only, we've created two or three jobs to the community already. And we are hoping that with the town's hope to move forward, that we'll be able to you know, create probably 20 to 30, if not 50 jobs in the next five years. And to me, that may outweigh the net, any potential negative impact. That's an interesting statement and I, I, I okay. Uh, I would like to call on Je uh, commission member Jeff Benjamin. Thanks, Annie. Uh, so I, I think my conversation wants to kind of bring it a little bit back to the EDC. Sure. Um, you know, I think the, the the conversation that we had around health and prevention has a weird dichotomy with what we're trying to do in terms of promotion. So it's like we're trying to promote business. We're trying to build the community in terms of the economic development. So it's, it's really that dichotomy of prevention versus promotion. So the question that I have for us to think about moving forward is, you know, with with the conversations they're going to have on the on the other boards and the other uh, committees is if this is something that we want to move forward with, what is a good recommendation for promotion that still doesn't impact the the use and abuse uh, uh, of the youth uh, where we can still safely promote the businesses to help the economic development without uh, an adverse impact on on what Mariah was bringing up with all the the health prevention. Uh, so that you know it, it isn't a question. It, uh, I just want us to think more about um, where we go from here in terms of the EDC plan with how we promote businesses while still keeping the prevention of health in mind. Can I? I, I, I appreciate that, Jeff, but what I want to say about the Economic Development Commission is that we must serve our community in its totality. We don't serve only the businesses. We don't, I, I believe that the Economic Development Commission needs to look at our entire community and how all business impacts our community. That conversation is wide open all the time, in my opinion, and doesn't happen enough. Um, I see that Raj's hand is up, except Gabrielle Smith's hand has been up a long time, so let me call Gab Gabrielle Smith and then Raj, and then Meredith Mann. Sorry, Meredith. Thanks, Annie. Um, I have a question, uh, Annie, if I could, that if you could direct it to Mariah, and then I have a comment. Sure. Um, so um, I've worked in, Mariah and I know each other because I've worked in the field of prevention for a very long time. So um, it's my, my question is, I tend to group, I know this is going to sound a little bit, uh, anyway. I tend to group tobacco in with highly addictive substances. I think tobacco is always the way that it's. Finding uh, some coffee over there. So if you're not oh, getting yeah, help, please get your microphone off. All right, are we good? All right. So anyway, Mariah, my question is, do you see um, marijuana and CBD and THC, um, particularly THC, I should say, as a highly addictive substance along the same lines as tobacco as packaged by commercially here in the United States, uh, and also other highly addictive drugs, opioids, pills, or would you group it as a as a as a drug that is capable by by many human beings who are don't have, already have addiction issues along the lines of alcohol, do you, would you group marijuana a bit? How do you see that in terms of its potential um, public health impact as a recreational or um, medical um, substance that we might have a, a business for in our community? Is it okay if I answer that? Yes, Wait, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I I heard kind of two different questions there actually. So to answer your first one, yes, uh, cannabis or marijuana has addiction potential. It's um, at this point the um, we actually are just now getting better information on kind of the number uh, of the people who use the number who will become substance dependents because the cannabis that's available today is so different than what was available when we did a lot of studies around this 20 or 30 years ago, right, the potency has really increased over the last 30 years 
or more. So, um, so we don't have a ton of information about what's the addiction potential um, now, but uh, I just saw some recent studies that said, you know, of the kids who start using when they're younger, um, about 13%, so one in 10 will develop a substance use disorder of kids who, who use for a, a couple of years, it's one, one in 20. So um, it's somewhere between, probably between 10 to 20% of the people who use regularly who will develop a substance use problem. So that's pretty much on par with a lot of other substances. So it's not any different than any other substance. I know we sometimes put it into a different category, but in terms of folks who develop a problem, it's fairly com comparable. Okay. Um, and then the other, so, and then I guess that's the thing I wanted to note is that sometimes when I think adults, uh, uh, older adults have conversations about this and try to think about policy or community, we think about the cannabis or marijuana that was available 20 or 30 years ago, and we're making decisions based on that, but that's not the product that's available today. What's available today is very different. The potency can be as high as, you know, 80% versus like a can of this from the you know 60s and 70s was more like 3% THC <laughs> now it's 80% that's a completely different substance we're not even talking about the same thing so i think that's important for people to get informed about so that you can make informed decisions about what that looks like and how that's available community. thanks mariah and then i just had a comment about sure um, about this uh, to that whether we have an outlet and where we have that outlet are both economic development and public health. You you can't separate those two things. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. I, I was here when Up in Smoke came in. I was not here. I, I was here working for the school district when Up in Smoke came in, and I I was very vocal about that about where that where that business was cited. I mean that you know which I'm just it's not there anymore. Um, yeah. But, and I think uh, to be not, fair to be fair right. to our community, current businesses such as uh, uh and i want me I, I think i i think meredith's man hand been up so long that i gotta call on her before you raj but gabrielle to be fair to our businesses in our community now is that it's a vastly different business than that was and also you know yeah anyway i could start. anyway i just want to finish if that's yeah. okay Sorry, so please. the reason Sorry. why i bring up i bring that up is because it is it mariah mentioned it is very important where we talk about, and I say this also for, you know, with Raj present and also for our select board, wherever we might cite this business is very important. It is as important as whether we have it as where it is cited, as where we um, set up, you know, if we have ordinances, we can set up so that we are um, making it, making it a place where it, um, where it is going to have a minimal, where we're minimizing the negative public health impact, especially for youth wellness, in balance with the economic development opportunity and impact. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. I'm very sorry for interrupting you. I just got a little nervous that uh, people understand that we respect their businesses. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Please forgive me. Um, Raj, I'm going to call on Meredith Mann, who's been waiting very patiently for quite some time. Hi, Hi everybody. Thank you for your time. My name is Meredith Mann. I am one of the owners of Magic Man. Brian spoke quite a bit, but I just wanted to say that we welcome anybody coming in and having any conversation about cannabis. All of this is important. Public health and kids are extremely important to us. I am a parent. I have two kids that have now just graduated high school that are amazing non-cannabis using kids. And I have a lot of information and knowledge coming from a supervisor position at the dispensary. And I just wanna say that um, on the THC side of this, which is very different in some ways now, um, there's gonna be such strong compliance that um, it's gonna be the safest way to keep kids out of it is to have a structure where you have to give an ID, go through security, you know, um, it just makes it a safer structure for our community. Um, and I do want to just say that as far as public health goes, it's extremely important and addiction is extremely important. And coming from um, the medical side, uh, you know, I've just seen what a huge 
positive impact cannabis has had on opiate addiction in Vermont and the need for it on that side. Um, and that's not talking, um, that's just talking about everybody, your mom, uh, my mom, everybody's parents who have used prescription drugs. I'm not just talking about your homeless junkie. Um, it's a really important big problem in Vermont. And I'm really glad that Mariah is here addressing kid issues and health issues in Vermont. And we want to stay on top of those conversations with you um, as we grow as a business and be as transparent as we can and part of the community. Thank you so much, Meredith. I, I just want to clarify from the economic development standpoint that homeless people in our community with substance abuse problems are equal in value to us. As Absolutely. I, know, I know you weren't saying that, but I just wanted to like, you know, mm. mild that out a little bit. And thank you for your time and your energy and for your patience with me this morning. I left you hanging there for a long time because I was trying to balance. No, I really just, my business partners really did a great job. I just wanted to say that we're open to all conversations. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Meredith. I'm going to go to Raj and then to uh, Oiso. Uh, I appreciate Meredith's comments. Um, it, you know, as a resident, it is, none of this has been speaking as a trustee, um, but as a resident, um, I, I want to, it was a little while ago, I don't know if it was Benjamin's comments, um, I appreciate those, and and it, it is an interesting conversation to have, um, you know, with this committee. Um, I do appreciate the fact that this committee is is looking into the public health aspects. I think it's important. I'd say if the Economic Development Committee and businesses in Essex want to see success in this area, that they would be well advised to be aggressive in accepting. Um, thoughtful zoning, advertising, signage, um, and, 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 and I don't want to call them restrictions, but, um, you know, boundaries. accepting things like that, um, boundaries, under, maybe. understanding that those, um, those have a positive impact and, and it, it isn't, I just, I'd leave it at that. If, if the economic development commission really wants this to succeed in Essex, um, you know, be honest with businesses and be aggressive in promoting um, prevention strategies that are proven to work. And I think failure to do that um, would make it more difficult and unnecessarily so. I do believe there are some benefits, um, but, you know, I think we need to be cautious in how we do this. I'm, as a village resident, not sure that there's a location I can think of, frankly, where I would feel okay with it with with having a site so i see much more opportunity in the town outside the village um just in terms of space but i really appreciate you all having this thoughtful conversation um it was great to hear from mariah sanderson um and yeah i look forward to, to talking about it more great thank you raj i want to be clear one more time to the public at large anybody watching this later on video and then I'll, i think it was a week so i was going to go to next but before i do what i want to say is that the Economic Development Commission is today going to nominate and, uh, uh, and, and elect, I guess, so, to someone to go serve on the committee for the cannabis discussion. This year today is simply a conversation that that now takes place at that committee table with led by our, our staff and 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 what have you. Uh, are we so is your did you need to say something or did you did you retract your? Hand? So my my first comment was just. I'd taken my hand down for a sec because I thought it might be too granular and I was just going to point out emphasizing what Meredith said um, that I have been to a dispensary in Massachusetts and they won't even let you in if you're just a casual browser you're carded you're I mean just about fingerprinted down there but um but the but the 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 pack the fact is is that it's not a place where like you can can even get in if you're underage. And so that sort of protection to get into this space might be something that we want to consider. And the other thing that I was going to say is that on the committee, I mean, I hadn't been thinking much about the, the cannabis committee other than the fact that we're going to be studying the topic. But, you know, frankly, I think that rather than debate whether or not we should or should not be having 
cannabis in Essex, I think that the committee needs to focus on the regulations and um, and all of the um, all of the controls that we want to have in place should the voters decide in November to legalize it. I mean, if if I guess if they're not going to vote, if, if it if it goes down, then there's no point in discussing it. And so what we really need to focus on as a committee is the mechanisms that we need in place to keep kids safe, to understand where places would locate, to have a larger sense of of um, of what regulatory measures we need in place. I I, I hear And I'm not speaking for the I committee because the committee doesn't exist. I, I understand. Perspective that, right. again, we can spend a lot of time debating the issue when the voters are the ones who are going to choose. Right. So I think that we need to be, we need to stay at a certain, um, a certain level where providing complete information to the community about what, right. what they need to consider and what right. we need to consider as a community to move a, to, right. to create is, a full understanding of the issue. Which is exactly why <laughs> absolutely has to be at that table. You've literally just described for me and to me why public health needs to be at that table so that the community is fully educated. It doesn't need to be a debate. It well, just needs to be a pre presentation of information, my opinion. I'm only right, offering that's what I was going to say. There are a lot of people that we need to bring to the table. Right. And I think that the group that we're trying to put together is the group that's going to be extracting the questions from, you know, thin air or from factual information that create the speakers, that create the um the the large pick and pot of information. Sorry for the Meryl, um the cannabis reference, but the um the the body of, of information that we're presenting to the um to the community. Sure. Okay. In the interest, of, I didn't mean to say sure as though that wasn't important. It was complete to me, so I said sure as in I ingested that. Um, in the interest of time, it is now nine ten a.m. and we didn't get to any other items on the agenda. But this has been absolutely exactly what our I feel our community needs for conversation. Civic engagement is important. And when this video goes up online, um, once we get it to CCTV, this value in bringing the conversation to the committee, I don't know if the committee is gonna be publicly viewable or not, but the conversation is important from every standpoint. Um, I saw hands go up and I'm gonna, suddenly out of nowhere, I'm gonna put a limit because otherwise we won't get finished. So I'm gonna put a, I don't know, one minute, I'm just kidding. But if you could throw down in a very brief way the next thing that you want to say. And I saw Brian's hand go up. I, Liz Subin's hand is up for the first time. So I'm going to throw down over to Liz for a second. Liz, you can have longer than one minute because obviously you didn't talk yet. <laughs> I don't need longer than one minute, but thank you. I just wanted to say that um, our community has a, has a robust history of having really hard conversations. And we know how to do that. And we know how to do that well. And I would just encourage this uh, group to stay involved. Of course, you all are. And to make sure that when we get to that point that we are having facilitated really um, informed and really um, intentional conversations with the community about all that this means. And I just wanted to um, thank you all for having this. And again, just to shout out that uh, Magic Man, the business and the owner, uh, it's a wealth of information over there. If there's any question that you have about anything related to this um, topic, stop in there and talk. The, the, you will be amazed at what you find out. Um, so I would encourage everyone to visit the business and to um, continue to stay engaged in this, in this conversation. Great, thank you, Liz. And what I, what I wanna reiterate, just to pull out from what you've, all, all the important things that you've just said, is that it sounds like what you're saying is, and I wanna just throw it because I think it's so important, is that as the committee finishes and finalizes what it's going to offer to our community for decision-making, that we have at that point a community-wide conversation that invites this kind of powerful tension-filled and I don't mean tension as in fighting. I mean tension as in as in as in shining, as in as in as in really crafting and growing something that has value. And so this this kind of civic engagement it has the most value. And so I'm hearing you say that after the committee finishes its work, which I believe 
uh, will be ro robust also in, in conversation, that the community gets engaged at the level that creates more opportunity for learning from both what Mariah is talking about and what um, Brian Armstrong is talking about and what Jeff Benjamin is saying so that the totality of what we decide upon when we vote is revealed to the most people that we can reveal it to. Um, now that I've said all that, um, yeah, I just, I just add one thing to that, Annie, and I would just encourage us not to wait till after. I think it's really important that the community be involved while the conversations are happening and while the study committee is getting going, because the questions that, that we all have as community members can really inform a study committee that is working to try absolutely. to see what the community is caring about. Absolutely. I would just please encourage us all to do this, um, not one after the other, but to do it collaboratively. Okay. Oh, we so is it possible that these that committee that gets formed that you're forming now is it possible we so that that is on video like this is can that be a community wide access so public can be heard and is that possible for that committee i don't see why not but as i said i would direct questions to the town manager's office because that is where this request for process originated I didn't see Evan here and I don't see Greg. So I guess what I'll do is I'll send an email directly after this meeting to uh, Evan and Greg and, and, and present this as an idea because the fact that you are also on, I'm teary eyed right now. If, if, if the committee can be this open and, and, and people can have this conversation and be in disagreement, but towards an outcome that's for all, I think that's the healthiest way. Also, I agree with Liz and I see Oweso does. So that's really great. Oweso, I'll send that email. Thank you for being uh, courageously open to that, to being the case. Um, so I want to wrap up this conversation, not because it's not interesting, but because we could probably do this till midnight. Um, I'd like to I'd like to ask Brian Armstrong and Meredith Mann to speak uh, briefly. I'm so sorry, not because I don't. Uh -huh, thank you. Go ahead, Brian. So really quick, first, just a background. The co one of the companies that helped start was KW Vermont, which actually has over 180 agents and community members, and it's been rated one of the best places to work. And I mention that because our goal is to be a vibrant member of the community and provide sustainable economic opportunities. The friction of the extremes does chart the best course. Please also remember as business owners, we are looking to purchase in excess of a half million dollars probably worth of real estate we have to start the process now to be you know able to operate in this environment so any indications the town can give us that they're going to work with our industry to find that balanced approach for public safety and economic opportunity is going to be needed sooner than later so that we know which towns to invest in and i'd love it to be essex where i grew up uh, that is greatly and deeply appreciated. And I'll, I'll, if you if you don't mind, I would like to be really frank and say uh, that literally that that uh, because Mariah because Annie Liz, Liz, Liz uh, quick, Darren, mute Liz. She doesn't know she's on. Um, Who she's talking to? Hurry! Did you get it? Whoa. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank, thank you, Brian. And, and to Brian's point, uh, I, that is that is why I feel that public health needs to be engaged in the discussion. Because yes, of course, of course, we want jobs. Of course, we want investment. Of course, and I want to make sure that 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 is balanced so that we are fair minded for the totality of our community. Because yes, Brian, I agree, absolutely, invest in Essex. You know, we we don't want we don't not want that. You know, but we want to make sure that this particular conversation has a, a totality. Uh, uh, Meredith, did you? Is Meredith Mann's hand back down yeah, now? Yeah, my mic, uh, my hand was up by accident. Oh, so, great, thank so you. I hadn't put it down, so I'm and good and thank, thank you. Thank you. Very much. And Meredith, you've been so patient because I saw some emails come through, and I really appreciate your your willingness to come to this meeting as as um, as a member of the public and to bring your voice to this conversation in the way that I had set it up for and. Uh, I, I really value that you were patient and thoughtful in your engagement with us, and I really respect you for that. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. It was an honor to be here, and I look forward to being involved in as many frank conversations as I can in the future. Great. Thank Great. you, everybody. Thank you for yeah. being willing to have hard conversations. Okay. My pleasure. Unless, uh, Mariah, I don't know, I feel like I hijacked your presentation uh, at the end, and so if you had any closing thought about 
uh, what you were saying. I'm open to it now, or if you feel confident with the way I kind of yanked you out of there, I just felt I just felt a rise of communication needing to happen, and I was like, let's just do that. That's great. It's great. I think it's fine. I'm glad that you got time for everyone to speak and. Um, um, and, you know, when people, I always forget that when people ask questions, things take a lot longer. So the presentation took a lot longer than I was intending. So That's I'm great. glad that everyone got a chance to to check in and know. I think um, I'm excited to hear that there's work to think thoughtfully about this in Essex and a group of folks that are going to do that. And my kind of final thought is to ensure that there are people who are very seeped in like the research and the evidence based strategies, like Raj was saying, to make sure that you're making those decisions based on good data. Great. Um, thank you so much. And thank you for taking. I know that we only intended five minutes and 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 we had I think this has been great. Um, if anyone else has one last tidbit to put on this topic, I'm happy to have you do it. But with that, with then we have to nominate someone to the committee and then have that conversation move on. And the Economic Development Com Development Commission will will post about um, or actually, no, we won't. Uh, I'm sure that the town will post about, sorry, I, I took on a role I should not have, excuse me, I got excited. Um, I'm sure that uh, Evan will uh, uh, post about what that committee looks like and where that will take place and how the public can interact with it. Are there any final closing thoughts on this very exciting conversation? Wow, all right, it is now midnight, just kidding. And so our, our next item on our agenda, or the piece of our agenda that is next, if I can quickly find it, is a nomination of one EDC member to serve on the research committee. Um, I had had, oh, thank you so much, there, Darren. I had had a brief one-on-one -on -one conversation with each member of our commission. And if nothing has changed, please, uh, Brian or Jeff, raise your hand if something has changed for you this morning. But if nothing has changed for anyone, I don't see any hands going up. I would like to personally nominate uh, Tatanisha Redita for a seat on the committee uh, for the cannabis study uh, being led by our town staff. Uh, can, do I have a second? Yeah, I'll second that. Thank you, Jeff, for this second. Uh, all in favor of Tatanisha Redita being named to the cannabis uh, study committee, uh, please say aye. 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 The dog, the dog also said I. <laughs> can I have a, can I please have a verbal I from each person? I, I'm saying I. I. This is Brian, I. Okay, and Tatanisha, are you also an I for yourself? I. Great, the eyes have it. Uh, Tatanisha Redita passes unanimously as uh, the Economic Development Commission representative to the Cannabis Study Committee. Thank you so much. That's Thank perfect. Thank you. Uh huh. And then Oiso, I'm sure you will connect with Tatanisha in that regard. Yes. Yes. Great. I'm thrilled with everything. Uh, somebody's running. I don't know who, but that's okay. I got to move on. The local option tax conversation. Um, I want to move it to next agenda, except that there might be people here that were literally here for just that. Um, can do, let, let me just take a little, a little navigation. If you are here only for the local option tax conversation and you feel very strongly that something you need to say about that has to happen today and cannot wait for two weeks from now, please raise your hand whether you're a member of our commission, the public, staff, or a guest. Oh, I could hug every single human being in this room right now. Oh, you all are beautiful people. I'm just giving it another second. Oh, I love every person in this room right now. Thank you for being willing to let this agenda be different than it had been put out as. So local option tax was our fifth item. We're going to move that. Is there was there someone trying to talk? No. We're going to move local option tax discussion exactly as it is. Well, actually, I don't know. We're going to move local option tax item five to our next um, meeting two weeks from now, just in the interest of time. And number six of the interweaving Essex committees and commissions to our next item. Um, if we have an update from partners or staff that must happen today and cannot wait till next time, please someone raise your hand if there's an update that absolutely must happen today. Universe is working in my favor today, friends. Oh, I could hug you all again. 
Brian, I'm going to look away for a second at the agenda. If you see a hand go up, please verbally let me know. Uh, the business contact list brief check-in will also, I'm just going to move that automatically to the next agenda. Our next EDC meeting is Thursday, May 6th, 2021. Um, and before I adjourn this meeting, I would like to thank every single person who even just came here to be present to this conversation and who showed up just because they heard about it. And civic engagement is the most valuable tool we have in our community. Please be civically engaged everywhere that you have interest. Um, is there anything else that anyone needs to offer to our meeting today from anywhere, from public? From um, Annie? Yes. This is Sam. Two yes. weeks from today would be April 29th. Thank you. So could you ex clarify the yes. next meeting? I, I really appreciate that because I forgot I did do that. So when I was when I was creating the date for the next meeting, I understand that the Economic Development Commission meets the first and third Thursdays of a month. So when I looked at the calendar, that put us to the date I just stated. So is okay. that date Thursday, May 6th, the correct one? Was I correct to decide that because it's first and third Thursday and it just so happened that it's not two weeks? Okay, great. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate you. So, Thank you. Uh -huh. The next meeting of the Economic Development Commission is not two weeks from today because the first and third Thursdays of a month don't always fall two weeks from each other. So due to that, the next, I'm correcting myself from earlier in this meeting, the next Economic Development Commission meeting is on Thursday, May 6, 2021 at 8 a.m. However, please don't confuse the Economic Development Commission meetings with the Cannabis Study Committee, because we are not that. So this was a launch for us sending one of our members to that committee table. The town manager will offer out information about that uh, kind of a study committee and how it can be publicly viewed and interacted with uh, in the near future. If you have any questions about that, please email our, our town uh, manager. Yeah, we good? Great. Anyone for last thoughts? Brian Armstrong, do, if you wanted to say something, I don't know why I'm just deciding that I don't know you that well to be asking you that. Okay, great. I just reading your face. I don't know. All right. Uh, thank you all so much. I really appreciate everyone and everything that has happened here today. I had so much fun, I can't even tell you. So thank you all so much. And uh, I will adjourn this meeting of the Economic Development Commission. Thank you so much and have a great day.